Okay, so welcome back to another exciting lecture of fish morphology. Today we're getting into the actual structure function of the fish that I've been hinting at since the beginning of school. I know y'all are all excited about this. So we're going to get into fish anatomy and then we will do classification of fishes later. So you'll make a picture like this on Thursday where you will have the caudal fin and the dorsal fin and the spine rays and lateral line. The perculum is the gill cover. It covers the gills. The lateral line senses motion in the water, chemical cues, stuff like that. You have the eyeball. Then you're going to have the maxillary. This is the top part or the top lip of the fish and the mandible is the bottom part or bottom jaw. You have the mouth, your pectoral fins, then you have scales, you have pelvic fins, and you have the anal fin. So, you have three different areas of the fish. You have the head, the trunk, and the tail. And these are going to look different on different fish just depending on what that fish is adapted to do. Some area, fish are going to have bigger head areas. Some fish are going to have bigger tail areas. So the caudal peduncle is the narrow part of the fish's body to which the caudal or tail fin is attached. The high pearl joint is the joint between the caudal fin and the last of the vertebrae. The high pearl is often fan shaped. So this is your caudal peduncle right here. Some Fish will have finlets or adipose fins. Sometimes you'll have spinosis dorsal fin. You'll have very spiny dorsal fins. These are soft gray dorsal fins. These are barbels. They look like whiskers. Catfish have barbels. This is your perculum again. This is the dorsal side of the fish. The top side of the fish is the dorsal side. Your bottom side of the fish is the ventral side. Then you have your pelvic fins, your anal fins again. Some fish have anal spines. So this is some inside gut stuff of the fish. We don't really need to know about this. These are your fish bone things. You can pause this and look at it if you want, but I'm not going to make you memorize the bones of a fish. There's a lot of them. So fishes were described and classified by body parts, mouth location and size, tail shape, color, and some special adaptions. So body shape, it's a good indicator of how a fish moves and where it lives. Flat or depressive form fish normally live on the bottom. They flap their fins up and down to swim through the water in the same way a bird flaps its wings. So these are going to be your skates and your flounders. We have talked about skates a lot in here. So here you have a skate. This is a flounder. They're flat. So you have your long, skinny, or filiform fish. These slither through the water like a snake. Examples are your American eel. So then you have your oval or fusiform fish. These are your tunas, your striped bass. These are fast swimmers. They normally live further up in the water column off the bottom. So compressiform is like an angel fish. These are typically your reef fish. They make really quick turns. They have quick bursts of speed over short distances, but they don't 
move much. So these are some pictures of compressiform fish. Sagittiform. These body shapes are good for rover predators like your barracudas, your pikes, your gars, your killifish. They have the ability to strike quickly. They are arrow-like. So there's your spotted gar and there's your barracuda. Your taniform is ribbon-like. This is like your eels. Okay, then you have your globby form. These are like your puffer fish. Then your anguilla form. Okay, these are your eel-like fish. Um, so, filiform would be more like your pipe fish. They're not quite as... wriggly as a snake. So... You can also classify body types by their functions. You have rover predators. These are your more fusiform body types like salmon, trout, bass. They have pointed heads, terminal mouths, which we will get into, and narrowed caudal peduncles and forked tails. We'll get into all the different types of tails. This is your salmon. There's that adipose fin that we were talking about earlier. So lie in wait predators typically have sagittiform body types. They have dorsal and anal fins placed well back on the body, a streamlined form, flattened heads, and large well-toothed mouths. Then you have surface-oriented fish. They're often small with mouths that are directed upwards towards the surface of the water. So these are your top minnows, your killifish, your freshwater hatchet fish, your half beaks, and your flying fish. Deep bodied fish include compressiforms. They are found widely in places that have ability to make tight close turns and they live in rocky reefs, coral reefs, and thickly vegetated areas. So you have your eel-like fish, and then you have your bottom fish. So then you're going to have fins. So you have your first dorsal fin right here. Then you have your second dorsal fin. Then this is your little adipose fin. Then you have your caudal tail. Then you have your anal fin right here. Then you have your pelvic fin. You, this is your pectoral fin. These are like your arms. Caudal fins, the tail fin. Sometimes you don't have two dorsal fins. That, it just depends where you live. Sometimes you don't have an adipose fin. Pectoral fins may be horizontal and down low, like in a salmon, trout, shark, or sturgeon, and mainly used for gliding. These are often used for swimming, holding position, and changing direction, directions quickly. Pelvic fins are usually abdominal, meaning that they are attached midway down the belly. These, when the pelvic fins are below the pectoral fins, such as can be seen in the above diagram, which we don't have from the non-existent fish above, they are considered thoracic. When a thoracic pelvic fin is attached under the gills, it may also be called jugular, and if under the chin or eye, it's mental. I'm not going to make you remember that. So caudal fin shape. Yes, you need to know this. There is homo circle. It's a tail. The tail is a modern development. It is symmetrical. It includes tourniquet, square, slightly forked, and deeply forked types. It is by far the most common caudal fin shape shared by most fishes. 
The heterocircle tail is an ancient form possessed by only a few primitive fish. It was ne so shark, sturgeon, and paddlefish. Its necessary tail shape when fishes have no swim bladders and were heavy in the front. If the fish tried to use a symmetrical tail, it would have plunged towards the bottom. Instead, it developed a tail with a deliberately downward driving design and supplemented it with horizontal plane-like pectoral fins that transformed that downward force into a horizontal forward driving force. So this tail has a non-differentiated caudal fin. This may be found on eels of all sorts as well as lampreys. So then you have a trunicated tail. It's good for maneuverability and short burst of speed. Not as much drag as round shape. Examples are killifish. This kind of tail is commonly found on fish in coastal embankments. So this is your little killifish. So forked tail, this is a good this is good for maneuverability and speed over longer distances, and it has less drag. So your pike minnow has this. See, here's another minnow with a forked tail. A rounded tail, like on Nemo here, has large amounts of surface area for effectively moving and acceleration, but it creates drag causing the fish to tire easily. This is why you have short burst of high speed. So, immigrate has effective acceleration and maneuvering, not as much drag as the round and trunicate tail. Lunate or crescent shaped tail. It's shaped tails like those found on a swordfish. It's not good for maneuvering but allows for great speed over long distances. Swordfish go forever. So do tuna. Tuna also have a lunate tail. And it's usually found on fish that live in the open ocean. Swordfish and black marlin. These are two examples of lunate tails. So here is a chart with all the different types of tails and a good definition for them. So morphology, scale type. Scales have evolved over time and are a major importance in classifying fishes. Most scales are deeply buried in the fish's epidermis or outer skin layer with only part of them showing. Below the pictures of scales are examples of how the scales would look on the fish's body. So first is your ganoid scale, it's a primitive kind of scale. Remember of the time when fishes used armor plating to protect themselves? Ganoid scales are hard and smooth and may take the form of only a few scales. Then you have placoid scales. Sharks have placoid scales. They're tiny tooth-like structures that are particularly embedded in the skin. These tiny pointed scales made of the same materials as their and our teeth make their skin feel like sandpaper. You're good. Cycloid. These are what your most of your fish are going to have. This is the scale you're probably most familiar with. Many fishes with which we are most familiar have cycloid scales, which are thin, round, almost transparent scales that we find when we are cleaning trout, salmon, or herring. These scales are mostly buried in the epidermis, allowing only the small posterior margin to show. Then you have tenoid scales, which are much like cycloid, scales except they have tiny comb-like projections or teni on their posterior edges, the edge that shows and are not buried in the skin. 
The colors of brightly colored fishes also show these posterior edges. So besides the scale types, there are also cosmoid scales as well as scaleless fish, which are sculpins, many catfish, some eels, and swordfish. And fishes which have scales so deeply buried that they look scaleless. Many tuna and anguillid eels. So mouth shape. We are on to mouth shape now. I swear we're almost done. We've got like 14 slides left. So you have long skinny bill, tweezer like, poking into crevices. You have a large mouth made for swallowing, tearing large prey. You have beak-like mouth used to graze on small algae growing on hard surfaces. I think they just meant algae there. You have a downward facing mouth, oriented mouth, downward oriented mouth useful to suck up food from the bottom or swoop down on prey. Then you have upward oriented mouth, usually feed at the water surface. So that is a upward facing mouth. It's also called a superior mouth. Then here is your large mouth. There's your beak like mouth. This is a parrot fish. There's your downward mouth. That's called a jander fish. It's also an inferior mouth. Then you have your seahorse, your skinny beak-like, bill-like mouth. So then you have cryptic coloration, which is a form of camouflage colored to match backgrounds and surroundings. Some fish, like the cuttlefish, can actually change their color as they go to match their surroundings better. So can some octopus, although they are invertebrates. Counter shading, dorsally darkened and ventrally whitened. Dark helps fish to blend in with the dark bottom when viewed from above, whereas the white belly helps them to blend in with the sky or clearer water from above or from below. Y'all know what I'm saying. So disruptive coloration is another form of camouflage colors and patterns that break up the outline of the fish, making it harder to see because fish's eyes are not as good as ours. They're much more simple. Then you have the eye spot, which is used to confuse predators about which end of a fish is actually the correct end. Then you have thickened scales that make for a harder carapace and make it harder to actually eat a fish. Then you have spines. They also may be venomous, like a puffer or porcupine pine fish. Schooling fish swimming in schools may have greater chance to survive than by themselves because you'd be harder to pick out. And we have nothing on reproductive type and we are done. Thanks for sticking with this, me for this. I will be back for Thursday's video in a couple days. I'll see y'all guys then. Bye.